Okay, if you have your Bibles, uh, join me please in uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. One, one of the greatest joys of Christianity is knowing that we are now living in truth. We're now living in truth. Uh, before Christ, we were living lies. We were living in error. Everything we believed, everything we thought, our entire worldview, it was all wrong. Every bit of it. Uh, but in Christ, he, he brings us into all truth. And we begin to have our eyes open. And our worldview becomes uh, biblically accurate. Now that's always growing. That's all we're always learning. We're always headed in that direction. But we are established in the truth of the gospel of Christ. So, in the scriptures, uh, we see quite regularly that the Bible will point out things that are true and things that are false. For example, there are true prophets, and the Bible also speaks of false prophets. There's true teachers, and there's false teachers. It speaks of true messages, false messages. It speaks of the one true God and many false gods. And it is also, uh, we see it a lot in the New Testament uh, in regards to salvation. There, there are those that are truly saved and there are those that are not. The Bible speaks of a genuine faith and a false faith. Jesus told the parable of the seed that fell on good soil and those that fell on bad soil. It speaks of the true branches that abide in Christ and those that do not abide but rather are cut off and burned. Jesus speaks of the wheat and the tares in the world. I don't know if there's any more clear scripture that speaks of people who uh, believe they're saved, uh, people who pretend to be saved, uh, but the difference between those that are truly saved and those that are not always become evidence. And in 1 John 2, 19, the apostle John, speaking of false teachers and false converts, said they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be evident that they all are not of us. Well, loved ones, not everybody sitting in a church belongs to Christ. Right. They may even be founding members of that church. They, they may have been going there for years. They may show up for Bible study. They may be there every time the doors open up. Uh, they might even be able to quote scripture to you better than anybody you know, but that in and of itself is an evidence of salvation. So today we, we meet a very interesting case. Today we meet a man named Simon that appears to be a believer, but actually in reality isn't. He seems to say all the right things, to do all the right things, but what we'll come to discover is that he did not have a true faith that led him to true salvation. That's why the title of the message uh, this morning is A Faith That Doesn't Save. And how many of you know that's real? There are false faiths, and we put our faith in the wrong thing. So, the question I kept asking was, how did he come so close yet fall so far short? How, how, how did he get that close to salvation yet missed it entirely? Well, as I began to, to study and to question, here's what, I, here's what I discovered. I discovered a few things that we're going to learn today. But I began to see that there's actually an interesting contrast between the person we're going to meet today, Simon, and the person we're going to meet next Sunday, an Ethiopian eunuch. One shows a false faith and the other shows a true faith. So uh, I didn't want to put part one today, um, mainly because I can't use this title next Sunday and my OCD will not allow me uh, to do that. Uh, so today we're going to meet the, the man named Simon who appeared to have faith, but it was a faith that doesn't save. Uh, so if you got your Bibles with you, chapter eight, we left off uh, in verse four last Sunday. The persecution is at the church. Uh, the church uh, was dispersed. They began to scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And uh, in verse four, it says those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Now in verse five, we're introduced again to Philip. Uh, you'll remember Philip was one of the seven that was originally chosen to help serve uh, with the problem with the Hellenists and the Jews. And uh, now we see him again. And it says that he went down to the city of Samaria 
and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. So, so there's the picture. There, there's the, there's the uh, situation we find ourselves in here. Philip goes down to Samaria. Now, Samaria was about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. So when they were scattered, they really spread out. And what's interesting about Samaria, if you know your Bibles, then you know that it was the ancient capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. When there was the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, Samaria was the capital of Israel. And in 722 BC, it fell to the Assyrians. After decades and decades and decades of rebellion against God, God finally said, enough, and he sent judgment. And what happens anytime uh, one nation conquers another, typically what happens is they disperse the people to surrounding regions. It's a way of weakening them as a nation, and they also will bring in their own people into the conquered city, into the conquered area, uh, quite literally to try to breed the people out, to reculture them. Uh, Daniel's a good example of that with Babylon when they brought him in and they began to teach him their ways. So when they brought the Gentiles into Samaria, the ones that didn't leave ended up uh, intermingling with the Gentiles. And this is where you get the phrase, the Samaritans. And believe me when I tell you, they were hated by the Jewish people. They were considered traitors. They were considered half-breeds for not staying true to uh, their Jewish roots, their Jewish heritage, if you will. Much hatred and much animosity between the two. And you, you see examples of that all through the gospel as Jesus is traveling. And it was the Samaritans, the city of Samaria, that James and John wanted to call uh, fire down on them. Uh, because they dared uh, not receive the message Christ was bringing and wouldn't let them pass through the city. Well, one of the first things we see here is that, loved ones, the gospel has the ability to overcome all, all prejudices, all divides. The gospel is for the entire world. And we're going to touch on this in, in just a minute. Despite what the Jews thought, the gospel was for everyone. And we're, we're going to see that briefly here in just a moment. So here Philip is preaching the gospel in the hated city of Samaria. And God is granting him a testing miracle. Notice what it says in verse six. It says that they were listening to Philip as he was performing signs. He was casting out unclean spirits. There were those who were paralyzed and lame. They were being healed. Uh, so God is granting him these attesting miracles because we need to remember as we go through the book of Acts, the reason we see this is because God is using the miracles to authenticate the message and the messenger. Amen. This is God's way of saying, this is my man, this is my message, it's the truth, notice the miracles to prove it to you. Those were the whole purpose of them being able to perform these signs and wonders and cast out demons. And when Jesus was uh, casting out demons, the Pharisees, you'll remember the story, said, oh, well, he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. He's casting out demons by Beelzebub. And one of the things Jesus said to them in Luke eleven twenty 20 was this. He said, if I cast out the demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. All of these miracles are to point to the gospel. They're to point to the kingdom of God as now being among you. And because of that, in verse eight, notice it says, there was much rejoicing in that city. It's interesting, Brother John mentioned revival earlier. I believe it's uh, Asbury College, if yeah. I remember correctly. Uh, well, I agree with Brother John. God knows what's going on there. Sure. Uh, but we know that here in the Bible that there's revival going on <laughs> in Samaria. Yeah. There's much rejoicing. People are responding to the gospel that <laughs> Philip is preaching. And here's where we meet the fellow named Simon. Notice in verse 9. It says, now, and, and, and this is, this is um, a shift, uh, if you will, of the scene, a shift in characters. That's why the now is there. Now, there was a, sort, there was a man named Simon 
who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were given attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So there's a lot to be said here. Um, your translation might say, uh, you know, Simon the sorcerer or Simon the magician. Actually, the term magician is not new to scripture. We see this all through the Bible, including the Old Testament. Uh, one, one example early on is when Moses came to Egypt. You'll remember the story. And he asked, well, how are they going to know I'm your spokesman? How are they going to know I'm the guy? And God said, well, I'm going to give you the ability to perform miracles and signs and wonders right in front of them. And one of them was when he would take Aaron's staff and Aaron would cast it down, it would turn into a snake. So he's standing in front of Pharaoh and uh, Pharaoh is saying, why should I listen to you? And he says, because I'm of God. And Pharaoh says, well, how are you going to prove it? So he takes the staff, he throws it down, it turns into a snake. And what does Pharaoh do? In Exodus 7, 11, it says, then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers and they too, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Now, we know that they didn't do that. We know that they don't have the ability to duplicate the miracles that God was performing, but rather, just like there weren't true magicians today, there weren't true magicians then. Magic isn't real. It's all illusion. It's all sleight of hand. It's all manipulation. And they did the same thing back then. Now, it is possible that there was some demonic assistance in, in, in pulling off the scam and pulling off the illusion. But this, is, but this is who Simon has been for a long time. And notice how he's described. First off, it says that he is astonishing everyone in the city. And it says from the smallest to the greatest in verse 10. So if you will, uh, in, the eyes of, in the eyes of the world, from, from the janitor to the president, Everybody was blown away by this guy and everybody was listening to him. And notice what he says about himself. It says that he considered himself to be someone great. That's the end of verse nine, claiming to be someone great. And all the people wanted to make him a God at the end of verse 10. It says this man is what is called the great power of God. He's actually claiming divinity for himself. So here's where we see where he had a really good scam going on. Simon had a great scam going on in Samaria. It was working very well for him. He was very influential, no doubt, and he was very wealthy, no doubt. But here's the first reason why Simon missed the true gospel. It's because he was filled with a prideful view of self. He was filled with a prideful view of self. In other words, he was completely self-satisfied with who he was. And the Bible has a lot to say about pride and none of it's good. Let me just give you a few examples. In Psalm 10 verse four, it says, the wicked in his haughtiness, that is in his pride, does not seek him. There is no God in all his schemes. Well, if I'm all that, what do I need God for? If I've got my life together, what do I need God for? Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Pride goes before a fall, right? <laughs> How many prideful people can say amen to that? <laughs> amen. James 4, 6 says that he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Loved ones, the most damning belief a person can have is simply this. I'm a good person. That is the most damning belief anyone can have. It is rooted in pride and self-satisfaction. That is the root of that belief. It is an incorrect estimation of self. 
It is an incorrect understanding of God's holiness, and it has a severe disregard for the true damning nature of sin. It is a complete disregard of what the scripture says about man, his total depravity, his sinfulness, his hatred towards God, his inability to do good on their own, their inability to love good on their own. Loved ones, the Bible is abundantly clear. True faith does not lead a person to see how good they are. True faith leads them to see what a wretch they are. Think about that. If you in your heart believe that you are deep, deep down inside, only the place God can see, I'm really a good person, loved ones, you have not correctly evaluated yourself. The deeper you go into the heart of man, the better man does not become, the worse he becomes. You see, we put all the lies up top to cover what's deep down inside. The deeper you go, it does not get better. It gets darker. It gets blacker. It gets worse. That's what true faith leads a person to see. True faith leads a person to say, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? False faith leads you to say, well, at the end of the day, I really am a pretty good person. Let me give you an example. Put your finger here and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. And if you're familiar with this passage, uh, please be patient with those that aren't. It's such a perfect illustration that I believe it is worthwhile for us to visit. Luke chapter 18. I wonder if Luke was thinking about this uh, passage when he was writing the book of Acts and came across Simon. Luke chapter 18. I love that sound of pages turning. Luke 18. Is everyone there? Amen. 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 Verse 9. Jesus told this parable to some people, now notice, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax, tax collector, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now, stop right there just for a moment. Where does his faith point to? Himself. How good he is. All the good things he's doing. But now look at this, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, where did his faith lead him to? God and his own wretchedness. Now, notice what Jesus said in verse 14. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Back to, back to the book of Acts. Simon's first problem was that the pride in his heart was not crushed. He was still completely satisfied with himself. Now notice verse 12. It says, but, and there's another one of those uh, words that, that, that's bringing uh, an adjustment uh, to the scene. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, the implication being they're no longer believing Simon. They were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Okay, so here's Simon. He's been tricking people all these years. 
Uh, we've already covered that. But now here comes Philip. And Philip is showing the true power, the true signs. Uh, he's, he's displaying real power. And the people are responding to it. And then in verse 13, it appears as though Simon responds to it. It says Simon himself believed. Now here's where someone will make the argument. They'll say, well, doesn't the Bible say that if you believe with your heart, then you'll, you'll be saved? That's what the Bible says, right? Well, loved ones, how many of you know there's a difference between believing in your heart, which leads to salvation, and believing in your mind, which leads to nothing? Salvation is not intellectual belief only. Right. It's not intellectual belief only. Right. Everybody believes in God. As a matter of fact, listen to what James 2.19 says. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So anytime you're sharing the gospel with someone, you're trying to get them to understand their sin that needs forgiveness. When they come to you with an answer of, oh, well, I believe in God, the immediate answer with tenderness and care and love is, well, that's fine, but the demons believe that too. And how many of you know the demons' theology and doctrine is absolutely perfect? <laughs> So they believe in God intellectually, but that does not save them, does it? So when the Bible speaks of believing in Christ, it's a belief that not only is intellectual, but it leads to a heart change. It leads to the understanding of the individual's wretchedness because, loved ones, the Bible doesn't say that we only believe what God says about himself. The Bible says we must believe what God says about us. Amen. That we are sinners that we are in need of a savior and that without his help, we are, we are naked and poor and wretched and lost. We believe not only what it says about God, we must believe what it says about ourselves. That belief leads to salvation. You see, Simon's motivation was greed, not sorrow. And, and this is gonna become very clear here in just, here in just a moment. And because of that, it says that he believed and after, uh, after believing that uh, he was also baptized, well, loved ones, all Simon did was take a bath. He just got wet. That's all it did. His, his baptism was not one of desiring to show the world that he is now a sinner redeemed by grace, desiring to follow Christ. He was just doing what he thought he had to do because he had a different agenda. He had a different motivation for believing. So let's, uh, let me say this and then we'll move on. Your heart cannot be full of saving faith and repentance if it is full of self-satisfaction and pride. Your heart cannot be full of saving faith and repentance if it is full of self-satisfaction and pride. Now notice verse 14. It says, Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now I can't spend too much time on here because we've discussed this once before and it's going to come up a few more times through scripture. This is the first group of non-Jews being brought into the fold of salvation. Up to this point, it's been Jews only that's received uh, the gospel, that's received salvation, that's received the spirit of God. And you say, well, wait a minute, they didn't receive the spirit of God. You're exactly right. And we need to ask the question, why? Why did they not receive the spirit? Well, number one, this passage does not support the idea of spirit baptism after salvation. In no way does it support that idea whatsoever. Uh, it does not support the idea of someone becoming a believer and then receiving the spirit later. Uh, the Bible is very clear. Whoever does not have the spirit of God does not have Christ. And in the new covenant, when you believe and you were born again, you immediately receive the spirit of God. First Corinthians 12 says that we were all baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. This does not support that. I must remind you, Acts is a historical book. It is not doctrinal. It is not an epistle. It is recording for us the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. It is a historical book. It is one of transition. So the question is, why did they not receive the Spirit now? Let me, let me point out a few things for you. Number one, notice in verse 14, 
What happened in Jerusalem when they heard Samaria, the hated Samaritans, the half-breeds, the, the, the impure Jews had received the word of God? Did they just go, oh, that's wonderful. Praise God. Did they go, I don't believe that. They, they don't even worship the true God. What did they do? This is very important. Notice what they did in verse 14. They sent Peter and John. They sent two of the leading apostles to them. Why? Number one, to confirm to the Jews that the hated Samaritan salvation was real. It was to show the Jews that, yes, their salvation is real. They received exactly what we did. And they've been brought into the fold just like we have. Because like I said, if it was through word only and they didn't go down to verify what was taking place, well, then the Jews would have had a reason to say, no, that wasn't real. There's no way they received that. This salvation is for us only. There's no way that it happened. So number one, God is confirming to the Jewish people, yes, they're part of this uh, amazing gospel of grace. Number two, it was to let the Samaritans know the apostles had authority over the church and they must submit to their teaching. The apostles had authority and the Samaritans, now part of the church, needed to submit to their authority and to their teaching. And thirdly, God did this. He sent Peter and John. He withheld the spirit of God until they come down and prayed for them to preserve the unity of the church. The Jews couldn't refuse it and the Samaritans couldn't branch off on their own. Imagine if you will, that Peter and John didn't come down to verify what was taking place, to explain to them what was taking place, to lay hands on them so that they received the Holy Spirit. And, and we have every reason to believe that they probably spoke in tongues like they did uh, in Pentecost to verify what was happening. You would have had absolute chaos. You would have had the Jews saying, you have no part in, in this Jesus. You have no part in what we're doing. The Samaritans would have said, oh, yes, we do. So we're just going to branch off and start the first church of the Good Samaritan. And it would have been division immediately. Loved ones, in this transition, God is overseeing his son's church being put together and built. Amen. He's overseeing the whole thing. So he withheld the spirit until Peter and John got there to pray for them, lay hands on them, so that everyone would know Salvation is for them too. And guess what? This isn't the last time we're going to see this. We're going to see it in chapter 10 when the Gentiles <gasps> become part of the sheepfold. We're going to see it again in chapter 19 when there's still some Old Testament believers following the law. The Apostle Paul meets them in Ephesus and they receive the Spirit after. So this isn't the last time we're going to see this. Because all through the book of Acts, remember, one of the main themes of the book of Acts is God building his church. And he's going to make sure that everyone understands that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, barbarian nor Scythian. We're all one in Christ. Now, verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that the spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and, and this is why we can reasonably assume that they spoke in tongues just like the Gentiles will and just like they did at Pentecost because they needed a visual sign that the Spirit had come upon them. When Simon saw this, he offered them money, saying, give this authority to me as well so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Ah, truth comes out. Truth comes out. All Simon wanted was more power and more influence. That's all he wanted. Here's Simon's second mistake. He rejected the offer of grace. His heart was full of self-satisfaction. His heart was full of pride. And it led him to reject the offer of grace. In Simon's eyes, the Holy Spirit was an addition to his life, not a takeover. The Holy Spirit was a tool to be used for personal gain. Notice who, he, notice who he's speaking about here. He offers him money and then he says, give this authority to who? Me. 
so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Spirit of God. He's been duping these people for years. And now he's seen another tool for his arsenal. He's just seen another way to, to, to manipulate and trick and receive something out of it. What he completely missed was that the Spirit is available and free to all who repent. To all who repent, the Spirit is available and it is free to them. Loved one, do you know that many today try to buy their salvation through good deeds? In essence, that's what they're doing. They're trying to buy their salvation. Uh, Simon offered money, but today we offer works, don't we? Okay, well, God, here's what I'm going to give you in order to receive salvation. I'm going to give you my church attendance. I'm going to give you uh, 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 my tithes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you my Wednesday nights, my Sunday mornings, my Sunday nights. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you. Uh, forgive me, I can't. I can't. Uh, okay, actually, you know what? I won't go there. Um, that that that's in essence that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to buy their salvation by saying, "God, look how good I am. Therefore, you should you should give to me something uh, because I'm, I'm I'm earning it from you." Loved ones, that, that is a complete rejection of grace. You can't buy grace. You can't buy salvation. You can only receive it in faith for what Jesus Christ done for you. That's all you can do. Notice verse 20. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. This is, this is a biblical euphemism. Uh, quite literally what Peter is saying here, quite literally, and, and all the commentators agree on it. They broke down the Greek and I won't bore you with it. Literally, here's what Peter is saying. To hell with you and your money. That's literally what Peter is saying here. He is livid at, at what Simon just offered. Verse 21, you have no part or portion in this manner for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. You see, this is why we can't go with some people's beliefs that, well, Simon was actually born again, but then he just made a really bad mistake. Well, loved ones, that's not the case here at all because Peter literally just told him, you have no part or portion in this. What is the this? The gospel. You have no part or portion in Christ. There's no signs of repentance. There's no signs of sorrow. And it makes, it makes Peter livid that he would offer money to purchase this salvation. Now think about this. I was thinking about that this week. Peter was extremely close to Jesus, wasn't he? He walked with him for three years. He, he was one of the, the inner circle. And, and Peter was especially close to Jesus because he messed up pretty bad. But Jesus assured him of his love for him and his grace and his mercy and his, and his forgiveness. Peter loved Jesus, loved him very much. He knew how much Jesus suffered for his sin. He knew how much Jesus suffered on that cross for everyone's sin. Jesus was Peter's friend. And it insulted Peter to insult the Lord by suggesting he could buy it. Oh, man, that, that's an insult to the cross of Christ, and Peter wasn't going to have any of it. For once, Peter speaks up and gets it right. Well, actually, in the book of Acts, he's gotten it right every time so far. But the point being, Peter was, Peter was uh, right to be insulted by that because it is indeed an insult uh, to reject the offer of grace and then offer money as a result of it. So verse 24, how does Simon respond? And this is further evidence that he never was born again to begin with. Verse 24, Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Loved ones, this is nothing more than trying to avoid consequences. There's no sorrow for sin. Um, I, I can't remember exactly who it was, um, 
but they said Jesus is, is not just fire insurance. He's not just fire insurance. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't claim to believe in Christ because we're, we're scared of consequences. We, can, we, we, we claim to believe in Christ because we have sorrow for our sin. Because we have sorrow for who we sin against. So here's another example of exactly what we read when we study the life of Judas. We read somebody that believed intellectually, but it never reached his heart. And we have somebody that's only sorrowful uh, in face of the consequences of sin, not because of their offense to Christ. It's worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And in 2 Corinthians 7.10, that's exactly what Paul says. He says, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to what? Salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Simon has the sorrow of the world. True faith is not trying to escape punishment. It is a deep sorrow for offending God and a desire to be made right with him again. It is looking at God saying, I deserve punishment. I deserve hell for my sin. But Lord, my greatest desire is to be right with you and to forgive me. I don't blame you if you don't. But Lord, if you'll be merciful to me, I'll have forgiveness. That's true sorrow of sin. That's what faith will lead you to. This faith just led Simon to a worldly sorrow. He had faith, but not one that saves. It's tragic, really, if you think about it. As close as he was, he heard the gospel, made a profession, got baptized, was with Philip, was with the apostles. But pride was never crushed in his heart. Self-satisfaction was never taken away. And as a result, he rejected the offer of grace. Well, loved ones, ask yourself, is it possible? And this is why Paul told the Corinthians, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Is it possible you're sitting here this morning and you have a worldly sorrow, not a godly sorrow? Is it possible your heart is filled with self-satisfaction and your belief is just an intellectual belief that never come into your heart? So I want to leave you with that thought because we should all challenge ourselves in that area. We should all examine ourselves, as Paul said, so that we're not deceived into believing that our faith has led to genuine salvation if it hasn't. So what are you really sorrowful for? Offending God? Or are you just worried about the consequences? What belief do you have? Not only about God, but about yourself. That's the real question. Do you believe what the Bible says about you and your need for a Savior? That will lead you to Christ. Let's pray. Father, take these words, I pray, and establish them in our hearts. Father, all of us desire uh, to make sure that we're walking in truth. So Lord, if there's any deception in our hearts, if there's any way perhaps uh, anyone in here has been following a false faith, Lord, I pray that you open their eyes to it. Lord, as your word said, I pray that uh, you, you produce a repentance in their heart that does not lead to regret. Father, grant them a, a godly sorrow over their sins. And Lord, help them uh, to look to you for mercy, for forgiveness. Lord, remove self-satisfaction from our hearts, remove pride. And Father, help us by your grace to respond correctly to the offer of grace. Because Father, that's, that's where true faith leads to. So Lord, bring glory to your name, I pray. In Christ's name.